Hello everyone, Halcyland here. Let's answer the question in the title. Can you beat the Outer Worlds without killing anything? And more specifically, can you get the good ending? For the most part, the answer is yes, if you are proficient enough in mental gymnastics. Today's build, The Diplomat, is here to show you how to use your words to forge a bright future for the Halcyon colony and avoid violence, even towards those who deserve it. Before we start, you need to know that this video will contain spoilers if you care about that sort of stuff, but before I reveal any major events from the game, I will give you a spoiler warning so you can skip past it. Alright, let's begin. The foundation of any character build is represented by the attributes. Strength is not necessary, but we cannot afford its penalty to our mobility, and as such it remains average. Dexterity gets 1 point for a little boost to relevant skills. Just like strength, intelligence is unnecessary, but for balancing reasons, it stays average. We put one point in perception for the exact same reason as dexterity. Charm also gets one point for a tiny boost it gives to all of our dialogue skills. The only attribute we actually need to maximize for this build is temperament. We cannot fight back and neutralize threats, and for this reason, we need all the health regen we can get. All attributes offer important bonuses, such as increased melee damage, swing speed, reload speed, critical damage, or headshot damage. But since this is a character that avoids combat at all costs, all of those bonuses are completely worthless. To put it bluntly, so far in all of my guides I taught you how to efficiently neutralize hostiles. Today, you learn the complete opposite. As you create your character, you have to give two skill categories a 10 point boost. The categories we'll focus on for this build are Stealth and Dialogue, so this is where your boost will go. I was initially going to add leadership to the mix and make use of all the skill bonuses offered by our companions, but we'll often find ourselves running from enemy gunfire. Since retaliation is not allowed, our dear companions can get killed. Permanently. And that's not a risk I'm willing to expose them to. As such, I'll be lone wolfing it without grabbing the perk with the same name. The last thing you do in character creation is choose an aptitude. This time around I recommend Kashir for a tiny plus one persuade bonus. Alright, character created. Before we jump into the action we need to make the rules of this playthrough absolutely clear. Rule number one, don't kill anyone. Don't kill anything. Don't even destroy robots. Now if you accidentally step on a landmine and some sprats go splat, that wasn't your fault, so don't bear those deaths on your conscience. Rule number two is to extend the no-kill rule to your companions. You can, theoretically, do a pacifist build by just maximizing leadership skills and companion perks and walk around with hands in your pockets while your followers unleash hell all around you, but that's not what today's build is about. If that seems like something you want to do, go see the corporate. She's all about letting others do the dirty work for her. I played with these two rules in place for a pretty long time until I reached the Devil's Peak station and couldn't advance unless I cleared the area of Marauders. On my livestream I couldn't find a non-violent solution and I progressed through the main story using a minor glitch I've seen in the 12 minute speedrun for this game. Something about touching Percival's pocket, running to this door and having him open it. Somehow. But I'm not a big fan of using glitches to progress my game, so after the stream was done, I went back to the Devil's Peak to look for alternate solutions to take these marauders out without the use of violence. I was hoping to find a terminal and unleash some stinking gas to get them to evacuate the station and I was half right. I did find a terminal in the environmental control room. And I technically did not break my rules when I hacked that terminal to activate the fire suppressant system, instantly venting all the oxygen out of the room. Sure, my actions did put all the marauders into a deep sleep, allowing me to progress the story, but I didn't kill them. Did I? If they are indeed having their eternal slumber, could that really be blamed on me? Stain my conscience? Since my only other option was using a glitch, I will say no. These are the kinds of mental gymnastics I talked about in the beginning. And say what you will, this was indeed a non-violent solution, just like I planned. Now here's the best part. Not only do we choose the non-violent path for the sake of a pacifist playthrough, but with this build it's pretty difficult to kill anything even if you tried. So you're kind of forced to find alternate solutions. Alright, let's get back on track. The attributes, the rules, they are both pieces of the puzzle that form a character build. The other remaining pieces are represented by your skill distribution, perk order, your gear and your playstyle. 
Let's start with the first one, skill distribution, which, if I'm perfectly honest, is a chaotic subject. So instead of saying which skills take priority, we will approach this subject in a fixed manner and I'll tell you where to put your skill points each time you level up, at least for the first few levels. First of all, let us take a look at our skills at level 1. Let's see here. Persuade, Intimidate, Hack and Medical are really close to their level 20 milestone, so we will take them there before we increase our main skills. Handguns and Dodge are skills we'll also use for this playstyle and they are 8 points short of their first milestone. You may also notice that Persuade is level 19, but in parenthesis it says 20. If you've played this game you already know the reason for this, but for those that may happen upon this video with no prior knowledge, let me quickly explain this. 19 is your base skill and it affects your milestones. What you see in parenthesis is the current skill level which is required to pass skill checks. Later on we will take the base skill to level 60 but boost it up to 100 with gear and perks. It will be high enough to pass all of the speech checks but we will only unlock its third milestone. We'll expand on this subject when the time is right. Now that we've completed our assessment, let's talk about skill progression. As soon as you hit level 2, 8 of your skill points go into handguns for the time dilation head effects. Now you may wonder, why guns? Didn't we say we won't shoot anyone? Uh, no. I said we won't kill anyone. But if we have to, we will use the pistol to cripple and stagger a wave of attackers to make our escape. Don't shoot enemies too much or you will break the pacifist rule. The remaining two points will round up Persuade, Intimidate and Hack to level 20. We also get a perk point at this level, but we will discuss perks a bit later. At level 3 we'll put 8 points into Dodge and 2 points into Medical. Dodge is useful for stealth. This will also be explained later. This build is called The Diplomat because of its reliance to use dialogue skills to solve problems without conflict, but there is a variation to this build I call The Politician. For all intents and purposes, both builds are precisely the same, with one difference in gameplay. The politician spends a lot of time with his hand in everyone else's pocket. Because I played this way, at level 4 I put 8 points into sneak to take it to 40 and obtain the ability to pick pockets and make some easy money. The remaining 2 points went into dialogue skills. For the next 2 levels, I dumped all my skill points into dialogue. Because of my high temperament, Lai reached level 50 before the others. No matter, they'll all be at 100 soon enough. You may notice that Lai didn't increase with the others after reaching level 50. That's because once the skill reaches that mark, you must put points directly into it. Which is exactly what we'll do at level 7, taking the manipulation skill to 60. Now if you get caught somewhere you shouldn't be, or grabbing something that ain't yours, you can use this skill to get yourself out of any potential what trouble. Do you think you're doing? Nothing at all. The points we gain at level 8 go into stealth and at level 9 the sneak skill reaches level 60 for the speed increase it offers at the third milestone. For now sneak stays here. After level 10 your priority is to level up the rest of your stealth skills to level 60. Hack for temporarily disabling nasty robot seas blocking our path and lockpicking to open up alternate routes to our objectives or getting some loot. Once all of your stealth skills sit nicely at level 60, the very next thing you want to do is leveling up dialogue skills, just like this. Persuade goes to level 60, Lie to level 75, and Intimidation to 75 as well. Why don't we take them to 100? All will be revealed soon enough. Remember, this is a puzzle. I personally reached this point at level 18. Once your dialogue skills look like this, you can go back to leveling up all of your stealth skills, preferably to 100. If that seems impossible, you can do a bit of min-maxing and take sneak to level 90, hack to 90 and lockpicking to 80. They'll all be at 100 if you really need them by just wearing the right armor combination. From here, the diplomat has reached his full potential. This has got to be the most skill-intensive build ever because we have to go to great lengths to not kill anyone in our attempt to get a good ending. But if any skill points remain, put them wherever you feel appropriate. Now that we're done with skills, it's time to talk about the other half of character progression. The order of perks. Because you're a pacifist, you will discard all perks that offer a damage boost or a bonus to one of your stats after killing something. Those are completely and utterly useless on this build. The most important perk in tier 1 is the one I picked in literally all of my build guides. Toughness. It's absolutely needed here because you'll often find yourself in situations where you're being shot at. Since you cannot shoot back, you'll have to learn to develop an immunity to bullets. This perk is the answer. The second perk is another one I never skip on Supernova. Cheetah. Gotta outrun those bullets, boy. Resilient should be picked next. 
5 armor may not seem like a lot, but it can increase your lifespan by an entire second in those scenarios where you find yourself dodging bullets. Pack Mule is a decent utility perk. You can carry lots of loot and sell it for a profit. Not that you need any of it. Lastly, in tier 1, you can make a choice between high maintenance or quick and the dead, depending on your needs. If you feel like your armor is getting damaged too often, take the first one. I personally chose the TTD regen because I find myself using that mechanic quite a lot as I run away from angry men with guns. I even use time dilation to rapidly steal their stuff before getting the hell out of there. In tier 2, the most important perk is Soliloquy, plus 10 to each of our dialogue skills when venturing solo. If companions didn't risk permadeath, I wouldn't even bother with this one. Next priority is Salesman, for some extra shekels when selling your hard-earned loot. To be honest, I never found myself in need of money on this build, but it's still useful to have some capital. The only other useful perk in this tier is Speed Demon, which makes it easier for you to escape hostile situation with the use of time dilation. But to unlock tier 3 you need to spend 2 more perk points, so take whichever you want. Can be a perk from tier 2 or even from tier 1, doesn't matter that much. Tier 3 is where another vital piece of the puzzle is found. Armor Master, the most important perk for this build. Grab it as soon as it's available. The only other useful perks in this tier are Solo Sneaker, Tactical Master and to some degree Super Pack Mule. Once you have all of these perks, use the next points wherever you want. The character progression is complete once you've reached this point. The final piece of the puzzle is your gear. Even though you're a pacifist, you'll still use weapons. The first one of these should be a melee weapon. You can block with it and the block skill offers a tiny bonus of protection when wielding one. The best weapon of this kind is undoubtedly the one named Soft Speaker. It offers a plus 10 bonus to intimidation when wielded. You want to know where to get it? Okay, I'll tell you, if you don't mind spoilers. Yup, pretty big spoiler ahead, so go to this timestamp if you wanna skip it. Alright, since you don't mind spoilers, you get this weapon on Monarch as a reward for negotiating a peace treaty between the MSI Corporation and the Iconoclasts. I just recently found out about this one and I didn't take it into account when it comes to how it affects skills. The Light Pistol is also great, as it can be used during time dilation to cripple enemies chasing you. As I've said, don't shoot them too much. I also recommend you add the Vermin Revolver to your arsenal. You can use it to knock your target out cold without killing it. Useful when your path is blocked by a menacing enemy. But weapons aren't as important as armor, because as you know, clothes maketh the man. Or the woman. Your attire is primarily needed for the skill bonuses it offers. Doubly so with the Armor Master perk. Early on in the first zone your options are limited. I recommend an armor that offers a plus 5 bonus to stealth and a helmet that boosts lockpicking by an additional 5. You can find both of these things if you know where to look. But the armor you're really going to need later on is called Protective Clothing with Safety Harness Gold. That's a long name. Let's call it the Harness, it's easier on the tongue. You can sometimes find the harness by pickpocketing sublight employees or stealing from their containers. If luck is on your side, you can even obtain it as soon as you reach Groundbreaker, but if you don't find it there, you can buy it from Dry Goods and Sundry in Fallbrook on Monarch. The reason you want this armor is because it offers a plus 5 to all dialogue skills, and in addition to that, you can also install mods on it. The mods I recommend are the following. Toughened in the armor plating slot, Electrocharged Surface in the gadget slot, this one will briefly put an attacker out of commission, Nightingale Step in the utility slot, which will make it easier for you to sneak around enemies, and finally, the most important mod is the Silver Tongue Kit for the skill slot. This mod adds another plus 5 bonus to all of our dialogue skills. As for the headwear, you can find a nice hat in this OSI chapel south of Stellar Bay. Plus marks the spot. Right here. Thank Mr. Skeletal for the hat and move on. This hat gives a plus 10 to leadership skills, which is irrelevant on this build, and another plus 7 to persuade. However, you need to know that this is not the best hat. It's a nice hat. The best headwear for this build is actually Reed Dobson's hat, because it offers a plus 7 to all dialogue skills. Unfortunately, it cannot be stolen, and the only way to obtain it is to put Reed into one of his Spacer's Choice brand dirt holes. Which goes against the rules of this playthrough. We'll have to settle for a nice hat instead. Once we have all of this, it's all coming together in the moment you obtain your 11th perk point and put it into Armor Master. 
As I've said, skills are very important on this build because sometimes the difference between a bloody massacre and a peaceful resolution is one point of persuade. So let's take a look. Persuade is at 60, lie is at 75 and intimidate is at 75 as well. Soliloquy adds another 10 points to all of these, taking them to 70, 85 and 85 respectively. With Armor Master, the Harness adds another plus 10 to all of these, and the Silver Tongue Kit adds another plus 5, taking Persuade to 85 and the other two to level 100. Now we put on the nice hat and enjoy a plus 14 Persuade bonus, taking our Persuade skill to... 99? It says 100 here. It's because of that tiny piece of the puzzle we picked right at the beginning. You know, the cashier aptitude. The one that adds a measly plus one persuade bonus. With all of this done, all dialogue skills are at 100 and there's no speech check that you cannot pass. Unless you suffer from dehydration or exhaustion, in which case, get those fixed ASAP. Always carry food, water and coffee with you at all times. To ensure your silver tongue is always sharp. I hope you didn't discard the armor and helmet from the early game. With Armor Master you can add a plus 20 bonus to lockpicking and another plus 10 to your other stealth skills when equipping those. Carry them in your inventory, their benefits outweigh their… uh… weight. Our character development can be sped up a little bit by accepting flaws. I recommend you accept only manageable flaws such as acrophobia, addictions or flaws that lower your combat effectiveness such as farsighted. We cannot afford flaws such as robophobia because sometimes robots hang out near people and if you're afraid of them you can't articulate your words properly. We didn't work so hard on maximizing those skills just to be set back by a stupid flaw. Similarly you have to reject damage vulnerability flaws because you cannot neutralize threats and you need to endure whatever they throw at you. A 25% damage increase will cut your life short. But don't take my word for it. Conduct experiments yourself and see if it works. And if you do take a damage vulnerability, mod your armor against that damage type. Boy, this was chaotic, but it's nearly over. Now it's time to discuss tactics. There's not a lot of combat tactics we can talk about since combat is only done as a last resort and never to lethal effect. I mean your main tactic is talking your way out of trouble and if you're dealing with speech impaired individuals you will sneak around them to reach your objectives. If neither of those are an option, running outside your enemy's reach is something that works every time. The tactic that needs to be discussed in depth, even though it's not completely necessary, is stealth. Soon. That's a lengthy subject and I'd rather cover the combat options first. If you have to fight for your life, use time dilation, aim for the legs and shoot. Or use the vermin and knock your target out. We've already discussed this. If an enemy is getting too close for comfort, bash him with your gun and he'll briefly get staggered, giving you time to make a run for it. It's preferable you use low level weapons to deal as little damage as possible to your enemies. And if you feel you're taking too much damage, equip some carbs in your inhaler and double your regeneration speed. I personally can run away from everything without a problem, in fact the pacifist holds the record for the fewest deaths out of all of my builds. You can run even faster during time dilation, especially with the appropriate perks. And as I've said, I sometimes use TTD to give me time to steal from a group of marauders while they shoot at me. I quickly take their stuff and then make a run for it. Now it's time to discuss stealth. To be honest, it's quite straightforward. Don't get seen or heard by hostiles and move quietly and methodically. You don't even need me to articulate this, you already know it. But I cannot stop myself from over explaining this subject in great detail, so... Here we go! In games like Fallout or Skyrim, you are the focus of stealth. You are either hidden, found or somewhere in between. In here things stand a bit different because stealth is determined not by yourself but by your enemies. You don't even need to constantly sneak to avoid detection but crouching helps lower your visibility when you're getting close to a hostile. When you get close you can see this awareness indicator above each one of your enemies. When a hostile sees or hears you this awareness indicator increases and it has several stages. The speed with which it increases depends on how close you are to your target. At the first stage which we'll call the blissfully unaware stage the indicator is white progressing towards stage 2, yellow in color which we will call the aware stage. The enemy heard something and its gaze is fixated upon your direction but it didn't quite spot you yet. In stage 3 the indicator turns red and your enemy is alerted. It knows you're there and it's going to come closer to investigate. 
When it finally sees you, it enters the fourth and final stage and it's fully hostile, and its indicator is brightly lit with an exclamation mark in the middle. On a normal build, I'd just shoot it and be done with it. On this build, however, your best bet is running very far and leaving the area. If you've taken some distance and your enemy takes too long to find you, it will eventually abandon its search and you will be hidden once again. Now what do you do when you see that an enemy has spotted you? Obviously you try to go behind cover and watch its awareness indicator decrease. The higher your sneak skill, the faster it'll go down. Awareness also increases when you're behind your enemy, especially if he hears your footsteps. With the right skills, perks and armor mod, you have to be very close to an enemy for it to hear your footsteps. If you need to sneak very closely around someone, do not move too quickly. One step at a time. At some points I really had to do this and I nearly got caught but I did successfully pull it off. The most notable example was when I needed to open the western gate of Cascadia by discovering the access code to the sealed door. The only way to obtain that access code was to open the computer terminal and dig around in its files. However, there is only one thing you cannot do when enemies are aware of your presence. Accessing terminals. You can eat, drink, have a smoke, do some drugs, you can even change the clothes you wear in the middle of combat. But god forbid you type on a few keys on a computer, even when enemies are far away and of no threat to you. Cannot use while in combat. So every time you gotta use a terminal and enemies are around, you're going to need to sneak around them. Or kill them if you play any other build. So I snuck around these marauders and my path was blocked by this fella right here. No way of getting through him. Luckily, if I'm here, I can magically teleport my hands and eyes to the terminal and obtain the access code. Another crucial terminal you need to operate to advance the game's story is the one in the geothermal power plant in Emerald Vale. The area is patrolled by robots, but if you know the basics of stealth you can easily bypass them without any violence. Let me tell you how I did it. I jumped the fence, took the side door and started sneaking around. I first needed to go down the stairs to my left and unlock the door, although the objective was right through this door, but uh oh, there's a drone ominously hovering around and I cannot get to the computer without being noticed. But I decided to sit still and watch the drone and see what it does. Sure enough, it came out of the corridor and fixed its optical processor towards the wall. Convenient. Time for me to sneak around it. To reach the corridor faster, I made use of the first dodge milestone and leapt past the drone. Now when you land you will make a fair amount of noise but not enough to alert the hostiles to your presence. When I sneak I leap from cover to cover but I make sure to wait a little bit in between leaps. Because if I do it too often it will attract their attention. Anyway I slowly headed towards the door with the terminal but the drone was going to walk in and see me. Luckily, these turbines to my right offer plenty of cover, so I jumped in there and waited for the drone to leave the hallway once again. Then I simply strolled to the door, opened the terminal and realized that I'm going to need to hit three safety switches to get the power running in the first place. Actually, I already knew I had to do that, but I'm creating a scenario to explain sneaking mechanics in greater detail. Anyway, time to sneak past this drone for the second time. I don't want it interrupting me. Whoops, it saw me, time to run. I ran, took some damage like a champ, quickly hit every switch I needed, but because I was in combat I couldn't access the terminal. So I went out the side door, ran past these other mechanicals, and then I took the front door. If you walk in through the same door you walked out while chased by enemies, chances are they are still there and they are too close for you to sneak past them. Switching doors seems to reset them. Anyway, I went through the front door and sure enough the robots calmed down and resumed their patrols. Then I had to sneak past this drone yet again, as I already have, accessed the terminal, rerouted the power and from here, sneaking was no longer necessary. I simply ran out with angry robots shooting at me. If I had hack at level 60, I could have shut down this drone for 10 seconds, saving me the need to wait for it to move. But yeah, this was everything you ever needed to know about stealth in the outer worlds. Remember, you sneak around for the safety of your enemies, not your own. You simply make sure you don't need to harm them on a pacifist build. And as I've already said, if you specialize as a diplomat, you are actually going to have a hard time killing anything, even if you tried. Attributes and skills make or break your character, and in this case, we are built to deal as little damage as possible. Before we bring this video to an end, I need to clarify something by giving a huge spoiler from the main quest. This event happens late in the story and if you've not experienced the game for yourself, you'd best skip it. It doesn't contain any vital information anyway. Alright, you've been warned.
Remember in the intro when I said that we can get the good ending without killing anyone? And then I followed up by saying that you need to exercise some mental gymnastics? Here's the biggest issue. The Halcyon colony can only be saved if Phineas Wells is able to revive many of the colonists on the Hope. But to do that he needs a very large quantity of dimethyl sulfoxide. Here's the conundrum. This batch of chemicals is being used in an experiment for which the board tricked people into joining. These people are mostly unskilled indentured servants who have been brainwashed by decades of board propaganda. The experiments involves placing these people into suspended animation and then reviving them over and over again to test the effects of intermittent reanimation. So far the experiments resulted only in the death of the test subjects and from this you can form a pretty solid picture about these poor souls. They are nothing more than lab rats to the board and their lives have been forfeit the moment they joined the experiment. Now the current batch of test subjects are still alive as they're floating in suspended animation but if past trials are any indication they too will die. If not after their first reanimation then after their second or their third. The board already killed these people even though their vitals say otherwise. Now when you infiltrate the laboratory you've got a choice. The first option is to keep these dead men alive and only steal about a quarter of the chemical compound needed for revival. If you do this Phineas will be able to revive only a handful of the Hope's colonists. And that won't be enough to stop Halcyon's impending collapse, despite your best efforts. The hard option, and the one that is at odds with the diplomat's rules, is to steal the entire batch of dimethyl sulfoxide immediately causing the test subjects to die in agony. Is it right to sacrifice these people to save those that can actually make a difference? Since they were already sacrificed by the board for a failed experiment, I believe I did the right choice hastening their demise for a goal that can actually be achieved. This is the only way to get the good ending. Did I kill them? Did I break my rules? After going through this extensive thought process I would say I did not, but I'll let you be the judge. From a gaming standpoint we only pressed a button, we didn't actually murder anyone and we did progress through the game without getting involved in combat. Alright, I need to open a parenthesis. As I was editing the video I went ahead and took enough dimethyl sulfoxide to keep the test subjects alive, expecting to get some footage of the game's not so good ending. Surprisingly I still got the good ending and although it's not explained in the final narration, I assume that making the board take my side influenced them into shutting down their experiments and safely remove the remaining chemicals without killing the test subjects. So in fact you can indeed finish the game without killing anyone, if you make an exception for these marauders at devil's peak. Nothing you can do to save them save for using a glitch. And I nearly forgot to share this final tip with you. The holographic shroud is vital to the diplomat. I assume most of you playing this game are already familiar with the shroud but I will explain it for whoever does not know what it entails. When you leave the first zone you can find the shroud in the captain's quarters. When you enter a restricted area the holographic shroud uses the biometric data on an identity cartridge to modify your appearance and make you look like you belong to the faction whose territory you're trespassing. Granted it has its limitations most notable being the fact that as you move around in a restricted area its energy depletes. But don't worry because you have three attempts to talk yourself out of trouble and that's what a diplomat excels at. I recommend you leave the area before your third try expires otherwise you'll be forced into violence. You can of course leave an area and walk back in and the shroud will be at full capacity once again. So if you need to thoroughly explore a zone feel free to reset it as many times as you want. And as I've said, you will need to obtain the identity cartridge of the faction you're trying to infiltrate. You can either find it locked away in a container or obtained from convincing people to send you one. Sometimes you can even find such a cartridge carelessly left around for anyone to grab. Well, this was all I had to say about the diplomat. The best way to play pacifist in supernova and survive is to go solo and stretch your skill points across all of the dialogue and stealth skills. As I've said, this is the most skill intensive build I've ever created and it can only be fully developed when you reach level 30. But from what I've played level 18 was good enough with maximized dialogue skills and the stealth category at level 60. Anyway, I've rambled long enough. This was it for my final build in the outer worlds. When I say final I mean major. I may release some shorter build guides but those will mostly be variations of the big ones I've published so far. And if you're curious about what's next on this channel here's what I'm planning to do. In March if they're true to their word, Tailward releases an early access version of Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. So expect me to cover that game a lot. Tutorials and live streams are to be expected. 
I was planning for my spring to look like this, but CD Projekt Red needs more time developing their masterpiece. So all I can do until September is be patient. Hopefully I'll also be able to scrounge up enough money to buy a better PC, this one is getting old. As for what I'll do until Bannerlord, I've already said on my channel that I'm going to livestream Kingdom Come Deliverance, as well as any other game I might play. If any good videos result from those livestream, that would be excellent. Alright, that was all I had to talk about, now it's time to say goodbye. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.